welcome to Frankly Speaking with Sandra D, where we dive deeply and help you wake up to the essence of what it means to live a real, authentic, affluent life. Beyond the balance sheets, the bank accounts, the private jets, the political offices, into the realm of inner wealth and personal power. I'm Sandra D, your companion guide on this trajectory of truthful self-mastery as we celebrate your individuality and your sovereignty. Welcome to another fantastic episode of Frankly Speaking with Sandra D. My name is Sandra Dorsey, most of you already know. But of course, you know, I'm always traveling the globe trying to find you the most interesting personalities to bring to you, the audience. And of course, I'm always so focused on founders, startups like myself, who had the entrepreneurial bug early on. So today I have Mr. Looney Libis. He is the founder of Africa Eats. I get his newsletter. So I thought if I'm interested in him, I think you'd be interested in him too. He's also an author and he's all, he's a family office and he is a fund manager. Of course, my background, you know, I'm all things finance. We're going to try to get a little, sneak in a little bit politics in here. And as it's, it seems to be like making the world spin nowadays. So without further ado, I'm going to let him tell you about who he is, how he got his start, where he's from and where he's going. So welcome to the Frankly Speaking podcast with Sandra D. So thank you for giving me a minute to chat. We have all the time that you need. First, of course, tell us where you're from and why you feel like the entrepreneurial path was perfect for you. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. I've always been an entrepreneur. I started my first company in 1992 at the age of 22 after taking my father's advice that I needed to go work for a big company after college. He turns out he was wrong. Turns out I didn't need to do that. Turns out I needed to start my own company. So that was a long time ago. That's 32 years ago. I was a software company. I was tech. I guess I was living in Texas at the time. I'd gone to school in Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, and I pulled out a map, which for many of you listeners was a piece of paper you unfolded, like the weird accordion folding. I put it on my kitchen table because when you're starting a software company, you can do it anywhere you want. I'm, I'm American. So it's a map of the U.S. I had been to Seattle a few times interviewing with Microsoft. It seemed like a nice place. What it seemed like was whenever there's one of those weather disasters or just like a heat wave or cold wave or whatever, that top left corner of the continent didn't get affected hmm. more often than not. So that seemed like a good place because I was in Texas and it was just way too hot. And I grew up outside New York and it was often way too cold or way too hot. And I also grew up in LA where it just didn't rain and it was hot all year round. So it just seemed like a good place to get four seasons and whatnot. So I moved to Seattle. I literally just got in the car, moved to Seattle started the first company, and then for the next 20 years, started software company after software company. First one backed by a courageous and crazy Singaporean entrepreneur. The next four backed by California venture capitalists. So I got to learn how the VC, VC model works by taking their money, literally getting on a plane, flying down to Sand Hill Road, meeting the big name VCs. Some of them would invest, built companies that way. And then... I don't do that anymore. Now I try and make the world a better place. And I learned that you can do that while using the tools of business at an upstart of business school called Bainbridge Graduate Institute that was founded here on Bainbridge Island outside Seattle in 2002. Hmm. I found it in 2011. So I was eight years old. I uh, started hanging out there as a mentor, just to, someone to give back. They asked me to teach and I taught there till 2019 when they ran out of students. Hmm. So that was incredibly useful. Yes, I got to help dozens of entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, but also gave me the opportunity to figure out what I knew from the 20 years of building companies. Mm -hmm. and so why am I an author? Well, because I couldn't find a textbook. So I sat down and I wrote what I knew 
into the form of a series of books, which is now one big 450 page book. What's the name of the book? It's called The Next Step. Find it on Amazon. I think it's exclusively on Amazon because I'm lazy. And uh, you can buy it in the individual book forms. Or you can buy it all in one book. And it walks you through the entire process from you got your great idea. I don't tell you how to get that. You got to bring that yourself. I tell you how to build the company out of it. And then that school inspired me to do something useful for the world. The teaching was the part-time job. The main job was I started a business accelerator for mission-driven for-profit companies. So for other entrepreneurs who caught on to this bug of let's fix the world through capitalism, uh, that accelerator is called Fledge. Pre-pandemic, it grew to be this big, giant global network with partners all over the place and uh, thousands of companies running through our program. Fantastic. It got a little smaller post-pandemic, but it's still there. Okay. And then that led to what my main job is now. So we had invested in companies all over the world, but we had also invested in a, a, about three dozen companies in Africa where 20 something of them were in the food and ag space. And they were not getting any love past the accelerator. Like mm -hmm. we helped them as much as we could. We gave them some money, but the rest of the eco business ecosystem was not funding them. So we created a company called Africa Eats. It's an investment company inspired by Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett, but not just to make money, to actually solve hunger and poverty. And it has grown, this group of companies, they earned less than $7 million in 2019, the year before we started Africa Eats. They earned $36 million last year, 36 and change. So they've grown fivefold in four years. Fantastic. Uh, they, they've grown a lot in the last <laughs> four years. And they're no, nowhere near done growing and we're no, nowhere near done adding companies to this portfolio and growing the ones we got. Uh, and next step for that group is we're taking the whole thing public. Oh, well, fantastic. Anybody who wants, will be able to buy shares in Africa Eats at the end of the year. Oh, that's fantastic. So you have an IPO coming up. Uh, technically, it's not an IPO. We're going public in the country of Mauritius. Interesting. We, are, we based the company in Mauritius. It's kind of like the go-to place in Africa to create a pan-African uh, corporate structure, kind of like Delaware in the U.S., like every public company's in Delaware. Correct. Like they're, they're not in Delaware, but their address is Delaware. Yeah, well, so it's an offshore. I, uh, well, I hate the term because that comes with like this taint of being, hiding things. No, no, it's up and up. It's like Delaware. Yeah. Um, and uh, they have a stock market and we're listing there and we'll have an app that people can use uh, to, to trade the shares. So anyone in the world will be able to, to buy and sell shares of Africa Eats and a series of our companies as well. That's fantastic. So you say you actually registered the company in Mauritius, but so what countries in Africa are currently engaged or involved in this? All right. So we have 21 active companies in the portfolio. They are based in eight different countries. Most of them and most of the bigger ones are based in East Africa. Mm -hmm. so Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, like the East Af the four East Africa Federation countries. Mm -hmm. We've got one in Ethiopia, two in Malawi, one mm -hmm. in Zambia, one in Botswana, and two in Ghana. Fantastic. So mostly East Africa, you're not interested in growing uh, on the West Coast? Oh, no. We or would love to have you know, more than one in every sub-Saharan country, but uh, you got to start somewhere. Of course. Of course, you know, I know I, I'm pretty sure some Nigerians are listening and saying, hey, you're skipping over us? You know, Nigerians want to be number one in everything. I, I'm so, totally aware. Biggest biggest population. Uh, biggest yes, population. they are. Uh, my co-founder, you, you called me the founder of Africa Eats. I'm, I co-founded Africa Eats. Mm -hmm. um, I am the only person in the entire organization who was not born on the continent of Africa. All right. So I'm the token Mazunga, as I like to joke. Um, no, token's good for something, but I have to say, sometimes you feel the spirit, don't you? Like you're, you, you feel that deja vu and you feel like I've been here before. Why do I feel so comfortable in this culture? Wouldn't uh, you say? Yeah, I got a little bit of that, but okay. Mike, so my co-founder is Jumana Tefawa, born and living in Nigeria. Oh, he is Nigerian. He is Nigerian by birth. And then his family moved around the world. He's one of these world citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, but he moved back to Nigeria with his wife and, and family a few years back. So, uh, so that's yeah. fantastic. So how did you come together? Um, I met him on my first trip ever to the continent of Africa. Uh -huh. 
Uh, he was working at Equity Bank, which is a big multi-country bank out of East Africa. Mm -hmm. He was helping them build out their business to fund SMEs. Mm -hmm. about SMEs, small, medium enterprises, as opposed to startups. Mm -hmm. We don't do tech companies. We do companies with you know, real products and real mm -hmm. products. And uh, you know the banks and, and the rest of the financial institutions in Africa struggle to fund SMEs. They just don't understand. They don't have the right structures for them and whatnot. Correct. And Mane had spent years in various organizations trying to figure out how to fund SMEs. So when I was there, that was 2016, which is kind of weird because I started investing in Africa in 2014, but mm -hmm. some things are slow. So I made it over in 2016. I met him at a conference called Sankalp. We hit it off. I was with an, a bunch of other investors and we had a cocktail party coming up in a, in like two days and we, I invited him to the, to the cocktail party. So we got to talk some more then. And then he and I would chat every time I went back to, to Nairobi. He was in Nairobi at the time. And then finally, when the pandemic hit, he had left Equity Bank a year or two earlier. He had started his own company. His business model was not going to work in a pandemic. It, mm -hmm. it was flying around the world and meeting people. And I said, no, come on, do, do Africa Eats with me, please. Like you, you would be the perfect fit here. And he proved to be the perfect fit. Fantastic. So his background is pretty much investment banking. Investment banking. Yeah. SME banking. Corporate finance. He also spent some time working with big global 1000 companies to help him scale across the continent. Well, fantastic. So it's always good. You know, I always talk, I have people come to me and they say they're looking for strategic partners who are in Africa because they do want to launch into Africa, but they need somebody on the ground. So that's definitely highly recommended when you're going to launch in any, I would say any sort of culture that is different than where you're coming from. For instance, if you're moving to Latin America, Asia, or Africa, definitely it's always good to have somebody on the ground. It's not like yeah. moving from the U S going to Canada for sure. Even then I'll let me stress this point. We are knowledgeable enough to know that and more. Mm -hmm. so the and more is we take an incredibly bottom-up approach to everything we do at Africa Eats. Of course. So headquarters is just three people. It's just me and Jumani and Lily, who's in Dar, Dar Salaam. Mm -hmm. We're not, none of us in the same city more than a few weeks a year. And even then, when we're in the same city, it's usually Nairobi. And we're not telling our investees what to do. We take minority stakes in these companies. Mm -hmm. They all have homegrown African entrepreneurs. So we're not mm -hmm. the ones who came up with the ideas. We just decided to, that these are the ones that have a high likelihood of success. Mm -hmm. We don't tell them how to run their business. We advise them on how to better run their business as in, mm -hmm. here's how you formalize practices. Here's what investors are looking for. Here's just best practices we've seen in other industries. But we don't tell them like, what opportunities to look for and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're more often than not telling us what they're seeing. We, we are then noticing, purposely noticing the patterns between these mm -hmm. companies to then share the best practices amongst them or just to connect them. So very often you know, we will get an email saying, I got a problem. I got a challenge. It's startups and it's Africa. So you mix those sure. two. Always a challenge. I got a challenge. It's such and such. It doesn't matter what it is. And, you know, I'd say eight times out of 10, our answer is, oh, you should talk to, and then we name another founder and the company and they've met because we fly them all into one city each year mm -hmm. so that they can meet each other so that when they have a challenge, they don't necessarily even have to talk to us. They can just talk. Mm -hmm. to them. So there's WhatsApp groups and whatnot where they can mingle. So yeah, we know that American ideas are not what's going to solve the problems of Africa. Of course. African ideas. My job as American is to bring the money. Absolutely. Bring the capital. You're doing well. Yeah. Bring the capital because there's more money in my local bank than there is in investing in Africa. Absolutely. Most African nations are still operating from the micro lending standpoint. So what's your deal size range when you go into a company? How much are you looking to invest and what's the highest you've gone so far? Okay. So with a few exceptions, all these companies came to fledge one of the fledge programs somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. seeking an accelerator, mm -hmm. right? They didn't come because we said we're an investor and we have this check size range and all in the mm -hmm. So first thing we did with all these companies, again, with a handful of exceptions, is help them with their business plan. And we paid them to do that. So we, we invested in the companies 
as part of the accelerator. So everyone walked away with more money than they started with. Fantastic. And this included coming to Seattle with me or going down to Peru with my uh, partner, Roberto, mm -hmm. or going off to the University of Padua, Italy, mm -hmm. uh, Barcelona, or uh, Pergam in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the first checks we wrote were between like $15,000 and $20,000, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The companies at the size were typically tens of thousands in annual revenue, maybe 100000 or 150000 at the high end. Mm -hmm. um, but they were pretty small, you know, two, three-year-old uh, SMEs. What one, two, three-year-old SMEs at the time. Then, when Africa Eats got started in 2020, our first check was fifty thousand dollars. So we okay. got much bigger. Our typical checks are fifty, hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. Occasionally, someone will forget something and just reach back out to us and say, "Oh, you know, this was missing." We just realized that we need whatever, 2,000, 3,000, you know, mm -hmm. we'll write tiny checks too for that. And then the largest we've written to date is a million dollars. That's in a, fantastic. In a single transaction. Yeah. So give me some of the ideas of some of the criteria when you decide how to scale these companies, well, how to invest, because you're going from a couple of thousand to a million dollars. What was the deciding factor to keep it at the bottom? And what was the deciding factor to keep it at the top of 1 million? Okay, let's not do hypotheticals. Let's do two examples. Okay, great. Case study. Love it. Fledge Seattle. We were running a program in 2020. We expected to do it in person in Seattle. Mm -hmm. out to be online. And so applications were due January 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the questions in the application was, what's your revenues last year? Mm -hmm. so we had uh, over 800 applications from 80 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was Golden Pot. Arusha, Tanzania, Heike Mate founder, female. They were working with 250 women farmers who had no income prior mm -hmm. to working with them. People who had no, such little money that Golden Pot had to provide the seeds as part of the deal. Right. Women who can't afford the seeds or never land, had to find land to rent and whatnot. And they had sold $24,000 worth of maize flour the previous mm -hmm. year. So that was the idea. Give them the seeds to grow maize, nothing complicated. Women grow the maize, company buys back all the maize, minus the cost of the inputs for a fair price, mm -hmm. and then mills it up and sells it in you know, basically a local retail. You know, why did we pick her? Just be clear, my investors picked her. I, I screened her and, and put her on the short list, her company, uh, mm -hmm. but the investors decided to pick it. And the reason was uh, a fewfold. One, seemed like a, we liked the impact. We liked the simplicity of the business. We liked the fact that it had gotten to 24000 in two years on basically nothing, on, on some personal savings. Mm -hmm. um, so less, it's not like a $100,000 grant came in and it made it to 24000 Sure. And then they liked the answers to the question of how are we going to double? And so I always ask that question. That's kind of my lead interview question for these companies. And it doesn't matter where they are. They could be half a million dollars a year. I'm still going to ask, how do you double? Sure. And she said, double? No, 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 no. We're, we're not going to double we're going to make breakfast cereal. I said, why do you want to make breakfast cereal? She says, because there's no local breakfast cereal in the country of Tanzania. And when she said breakfast cereal, it was breakfast cereal, porridge, you know, just add water, get porridge. Sure. And I said, okay, I had been to Tanzania once before. I said, do this, go to the supermarket and shoot me a really short video of the cereal aisle. Yep. Like, I just want to see what's available. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me see what this opportunity is that you see. Sure. So she did that and sent it back. And the cereal aisle was a lot smaller than American cereal aisles because we're crazy mm -hmm. about cereal. Sure. And it's about the same size as like when I go to Europe or, or elsewhere. It's right. A it's not a super size Walmart. Yeah, yeah. A few meters wide. And there were two brands and only two brands. Mm -hmm. so the Kellogg section with the cornflakes, the white box with the rooster and you know, raisin bran and all the other stuff you used to sing. And then there's the Weetabix section. And you, you said you lived in the UK, so you know the Weedabix yes. brand. They don't yes. show up here in the States. And that's it. Those were the choices. So there were like 10 different cereals to pick from, but two brands. And there was nothing else. But what I could see is, look, there's definitely a, a demand for cereal because there's this much shelf space taken up at the local supermarket. And it's just the local sure. middle supermarket, right? Nothing fancy. Not mm -hmm. caro, right? Not, not, not high end. And there is an, and, and we talked about like what cereal she would make and whatnot. And so they, there's got to be an opportunity here of some sort. And no doubt, like 
I didn't have to read any McKinsey research to understand that if we're using local products, right. and local manufacturing, and putting right. it all together in Tanzania, that will probably be half the price of these imports. Correct. All that's imported, not nothing manufactured yep. anywhere near. It's not maybe maybe the Weetabix was made in South Africa, but it wasn't mm -hmm. made in uh, Tanzania or Kenya or, or nearby. And so, of course, the next question was, well, how much is it going to cost to get all this set up? And she had mm -hmm. already gone through her, her research on that. It was like $100,000. And uh, so we invited her into Fledge before we even knew Africa Eats was going to get going. Uh -huh. And then as soon as Africa Eats got going, we refined that plan. We funded it. As normal, that was an underestimation, and it was more like $150,000, but you know, not a huge difference. And she's now manufacturing breakfast cereal and selling decent quantities of breakfast cereal. Meanwhile, selling almost a million dollars worth of maize flour as well. So oh, amazing. That business got a little bit bigger too. Yeah. So how many, how big is the staff now? How many people, how has it grown? So it did a million four last year. Fantastic. So the company went from 24,000 to a million four. Total capital, including one grant that we matched was maybe $300,000. Fantastic. Across those four years. So any of those ventures are, is the government participating in any of these ventures? So you mentioned a grant, so that must be from the government? No, it came from a European NGO. The, um, so the local governments are not helping it. There are no infrastructures for these small companies? We've not seen anything, if, if there is. We see occasionally a small grant. We have a grant writing team that, that's out seeking grants. They're sporadic. Mm -hmm. none, none of them have been big yet. That was an 80,000 euro grant. And one of the frustrating pieces of doing business with the grantors, these days, they're almost always matching grants. Mm -hmm. Like we'll give you $50,000, 80,000 euros, $25,000, if you match it one-to-one. -one. I was going to ask you, what are some of the challenges? So that clearly that's one of them. If you're an SME outside of our portfolio and you win mm -hmm. one of the grants, it doesn't actually solve any problems because you can't have it. Cause It'll take you another 18 months to find a funder that will fund you and fingers crossed by then that the grant is still around. But yeah, I don't know why they do it, I don't, but I, I, they shouldn't do it. But I, I promised you two case studies because you asked about the high end. Yes, um, please. Okay, so I'm actually going to tell you the, the highest end story. I'll do the second one, which is one of our entrepreneurs, he actually went to Fledge in Peru, but he's from Rwanda. He started a meat processing company in Rwanda. We'll not go too deep into it, but he's one of the children of the crisis in Rwanda. Okay. And so he grew up with 20 kids, his mom and three other moms and no fathers, and they ate meat on Christmas. So he saw the problems of protein deficiency firsthand mm -hmm. he wanted to solve it. So he built what was, when we met him, the fourth largest meat processing company in Rwanda, which was earning $35,000 a year. Fourth largest in the country at $35,000 a year. Wow. And so uh, that company's doing great. I'm not going to talk about that company. It's also doing more million dollars now. Fantastic. In the lockdown, one of the challenges he was having building a meat company was there wasn't any trucking company he could find that had a fleet of refrigerated trucks. Okay. So things we take for granted in the States and in Europe and, Completely. and Global North we all have refrigerators, all our stores have refrigerated. The chicken and the beef and whatnot is refrigerated from minutes after it's slaughtered. Sure. And instead, in Africa, it just doesn't happen that way. There's almost no cold chain. Right. So he found a guy, and you can't lease a truck from the manufacturers, and you can go to the bank and ask for a truck loan, and they will literally say, what's your collateral? And they mm. don't mean what's your 20% of the collateral because the truck's the rest. They mean what's your collateral for 100% because they don't count trucks as collateral, right? So you really just can't get trucks. It's very hard right. to do a, uh, build a logistics fleet. So he found a guy with four very old, worn out, refrigerated trucks, the European trucks. And he made a deal with the guy to pay him on a monthly basis for the trucks. So technically that's a truck lease, but it's just a human to human, person to person deal. and. He took control of the four trucks. He started a company, incorporated another company, which in Rwanda takes 15 minutes. And he did talk to the government about using some cold rooms that existed already. Uh -huh. And he did this in April of 2020, like basically during the two-week lockdown in Rwanda. 
the company lost money in April of 2020, and that's the last time it's ever lost money. Hmm. Now, a normal entrepreneur at this point who is associated with an investment company would ask us for some money, mm -hmm. but he's an extraordinary entrepreneur. So he just ran a, little, ran a company and earned some money in the first year, proving it out. He just basically wanted to prove it out. And in the next year, he also didn't ask us for money, but he managed without any investment to build a business doing a half million dollars a year in a year and a half. That is absolutely and He fantastic. came to us and said, okay, it's working. Can we have $150,000 to get two more trucks to scale it up? Right? And it was a five truck fleet by then because he had enough profits to buy a fifth truck or buy his first truck, but right. grow the fleet to five. So we looked at the numbers and, you know, we're investors. So of course we're looking at numbers, like we're hearing the story and all that, but we're also okay. into the income statement and the balance sheet and all that. And this is the first time in my life as an investor where I said, no, you're not asking for enough. I need to give you more. Will you accept more money? He's the only entrepreneur I've ever done that with. And we said 200,000. And if I had more, I would have done more. I just, that's all the money we had for that we could afford in this. And this is a new company to us. And so we invested $200,000 and he got three trucks instead of two trucks. That year with just that $200,000, the business did $2.2 .2 million and 35% pre-tax margins. 2.2 .2 million. That's yeah. fantastic. So third year profits were higher than $200,000, but we're equity investors. So we didn't want to back like mm -hmm. co-owners of this with them. He asked for more at the end of the year and we provided him $400,000 more. And then we became uh, lenders to him because we didn't want to just keep taking equity. And then he asked for more again, about six, seven months later, and we got him another like three, $400,000. Mm -hmm. So we've invested $850,000 in this company over a three-year period. Uh, and it did 6.4 6 million last year. That's phenomenal. My goodness. So do you feel when you see these unfoldments, do you feel like a proud father <laughs> watching their child graduate with the cap and gown? Is it, do you feel like mission accomplished all those years, the sweat, <laughs> all that was worth it? I can feel that in your tone, your smile, you just exude yeah. pride. It's as though, I mean, of course you say you don't want to, I'm sure you'll say, I don't want to take credit for it because all I did was give money, but there's still that sense of give credit where credit's due. You did participate in uh, watching this company expand. So it so, must be good. Yes. On the pride part. Absolutely. Right. I, I have four kids and I have a hundred and something fledglings, right? And, and we call them BZ in Africa Eats. We get 21 BZ, but no on the cap and gown. Cause we're not done. That's just year four. Like this company, when, when they're a hundred million dollars, they're still not going to be done. These opportunities, it sounds like, okay, it's a little breakfast cereal company in Tanzania, but like in 20 years, this could be the general mills of Tanzania. Absolutely. Of Africa. Forget it. Forget well, East Tanzania. Africa. Right? It could be pan Africa, but let's just, e even if it was just even if she never got past, even if Golden Pot never got past Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, right? And it, and it will, but even if it didn't, that is almost the population of the United States. That's like 250 mm -hmm. million people, right? And I just said, I just saw this stat and, uh, and shared it with the group. Like I hadn't seen this before. The projected population of Tanzania in 2100 is like 700 million people. Like you talk about you were, uh, of Nigeria being big, Tanzania is going to be the next biggest country to Nigeria in another 80 years. It's going to be. A yeah. Problem. Because the majority of their population are like under 10 years old or it's quite it's like 19. Young. Yeah. Half, half or 19, but I guess they have a slightly bigger family size than other parts of the, mm -hmm, other parts mm -hmm. of the region. But anyway, even if we just say it's going to grow 50% in the next 30 years, which is true, no matter what, like mm -hmm. it will, cause the kids all have kids. Like this could be a business the size of General Mills was in the States in the fifties or the sixties. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. In the 2030s, 2040s. And then truck is the name of the trucking company in Rwanda, T-R-U-K, mm -hmm. which is actually in Africa Eats. We came up with the name. We were looking for a name for a trucking company that would be, um, 
a good name for a company operating in East Africa. And the logo is literally the word truck. And underneath each letter is a, is a flag. And it is Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya. Oh my goodness. What a legacy you are building. That's just phenomenal. How old are your children? Are they learning from your experiences? My kids age uh, range from 11 to 24. My goodness. Are they like, dad, are we going to Africa? I want to go to back to Africa. It's, a, it's Africa's more fun than, and than America right now. <laughs> they, they've never been, but uh, not been. never been the, the 11 year olds on well, she's coming with to Mauritius on the next trip. Oh, that's fantastic. So we talk about this. So of course, you know, you're going to have to come back to the podcast with one of your, what is it? Budsies? What do you call Be them? Beezy. It's Beezy. I was close. Beezies. Yeah. You're going to have to bring one of your Beezies to talk about their experience with yeah. America, uh, with uh, Africa Eats. Oh, maybe I just said America Eats. Maybe you should have America Eats too. I don't know where. where Somebody it's else can do that one. I'm, 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 busy. I'm, I'm busy in Africa. Somebody else can do America Eats. <laughs> If America still exists, I see I'm getting into politics again. I'm going to avoid that for a little bit. So this is phenomenal. You seem excited. The fact that this is just growing exponentially, you're going to take this public and at the end of the year, how engaged are you going to continue? Are you building a team to take over your responsibilities or are you going to still stay as active once you go I'm public? a big fan of Warren Buffett. But we took a lot of lessons from Berkshire Hathaway in building this company. So just to be clear, we're not a fund. We're not in it for 10 years like a venture capital fund or a PE fund. This is an investment company. And if you ask Warren when he's going to retire, his answer is five or 10 years after he's dead. Yeah. So no, I have a team, right? The team will get bigger as we have more companies. We only have 21 companies. We don't need more than three of us. But we'll add more in time as we add more companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, yeah, we'll continue to run the company. And I intend to retire and hand this off to Jumani a few years after I'm dead. So where you're living, it's in the state of Washington. It's a little island. Yeah. You're kind of yeah. a recluse. So you probably have, what, what is your average day when you go back home? In comparison, when you go to Africa in bustling towns and loud cities, probably, I'm sure you're not visiting the most remote parts of Africa. You're in the midst of it. I mean, if you go to Kenya, probably in Nairobi. And if you go to, I don't know what other countries you're visiting, but you're usually in the capital. That must be quite a contrast from your little sort of isolated home and in Washington state. I live in the town. Like literally we walk to the grocery store. We walk to school. My kids. It's a safe neighborhood and all that. My typical day though, is getting up in the morning and talking to somebody at the end of their day in Africa. Uh -huh. uh, and then having meetings with people in the U S in the afternoon catching up on all the email flow and all the stuff that's going on and then having dinner, taking a break. And then a few times a week, finishing off my day at 9 PM, 10 PM, 11 PM, having calls with people in Africa again. So my time zone's completely inconvenient, except it gives me a block of time in the day when the people I'm working with are not interrupting me. It also makes Africa eats kind of a 24 seven operation. Cause somebody's sure. week, we span 11 time zones. And then when I go off to Africa, no, I'm not always in the big cities. I'll typically land in Nairobi and the big conferences and our annual gathering are in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. We'll also go visit some of our companies and they're not always in the big cities. They're often out by the farmers. So we just took a trip in March. We visited four companies. So we landed in Dar. I think we immediately changed planes and flew to Doma. Dodoma is a lot smaller city. And then Swahili Honey is oh, maybe a half an hour out of the city, but it's definitely not in the city. Mm -hmm. Past where the suburban houses are by a little bit. And then we flew back to Dar and drove the next day for two, three hours north to mm -hmm. go visit Agathe Dairy based in a small town up north. And then we stopped at Golden Pot on the way back. And she is operating in Dar, but kind of Dar is humongous. You can drive for mm -hmm. two hours to be in Dar. Mm -hmm. But she's not near downtown at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we stopped at East Africa Foods on the way. They had processing facilities in Dodoma and Dar. And they are our biggest company. They did 14 million last year, up from 100 Oh, wow. Uh, and their year old headquarters is at the top floor of an office building. So, yeah, we got to go up to 19, 20 floors up and, and not downtown, downtown, but kind of the, the next level of buildings. So yeah, now we're doing some fancy office buildings. Our, our companies are big enough for that.
That's fantastic. So have you built some close relationships so close that when you go visit these companies, these towns, that you stay with the founders or your, okay, you're going to have to remind me, Budzies, Budzies? Okay. So in Shona, right, which is a language in uh, Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. not these Zimbabwe companies, but somebody suggests this. In Shona, the word Mbizi Mbiz, okay. is Mbizi. elephant. So we actually talk about bottom up just for a second. Okay, right. So bottom up is we had our first gathering in in 2021. We started mm -hmm. in 2020 and we couldn't get together because there was a pandemic. Uh, you might have seen that in the news. Right. Uh, and so we got together as soon as we could in 21. And one of the agenda items is we don't want to call you guys investees. We don't want to call you portfolio companies. Like we don't have that relationship with you. We want another term. Right. And I don't know. I don't have another term to throw out there. Fledgling is what we were using at Fledge, but it sounds small and it's, right. it's English and whatnot. Everybody just chime in with words you think are good. Uh, yeah, everybody tell us what you think of the words that have been thrown so far. And also some of the ideas that are out there and put at the comment, your ideas. You never know what would be the next big one. So basically we crowdsourced it from our crowd live in person. And one of the person people stood up, one of the entrepreneurs, she said, well, I think we should be Mbizi because A, it's an African Mbizi. term. Mbizi. It means elephant. Like we're big and strong. We're not mm -hmm. unicorns. Like if you want to compare what we do with the- Oh, Mbizi, that makes sense. Right? We're not unicorns. We are a big, the companies are big and strong and will grow to be huge. And they're not mythical. They're real, right? And so we, we all agreed. And there was a couple other ideas for, tossed around that if you ask in the crowd i think out of the 25 founders we, mm -hmm. we once i think they speak 35 languages oh my goodness that's it's some humongous number because some of them speak like five um and and so yeah the consensus was in busy and busy is good so we ran with that and it's for americans that's in busy starts with an m B I Z I M B I Z I. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So those okay. of you in the, um, uh, watching this in the audience, tell us rate one to 10, how you like the word one okay. to 10, just put your comments in there. So then just to finish the story, Go ahead. Uh, the problem was about a month later, I was emailing someone and they said, why are you calling your companies pigs? <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, oh yeah. in this Ugandan language and busy means pig. And I said, oh, okay. Well, nobody spoke that language in the room. We had a whole bunch of people from Uganda, but there's a lot of different languages and not, and, and they're, you know, more Swahili speakers. That's, so, a, that's funny. And so we dropped the M. And uh, that is, so it's now just BZ. B-I-Z-I. -I, B -B B-I-Z-I. Tell us, what does it mean in your language? If anyone, it doesn't matter if it's just, it's not Africa. If you're listening and you, what does the word remind you of? And we'll get back to you as far, but rate it, rate it. How do you like the word? I like it. I mean, as long as I can remember it. I'm from Haiti originally. So I'm familiar with having much, you know, different dialects. So okay. yes. So this is fantastic. So I want to know, I mean, I could talk to you forever because I know we skipped over your tech journey and you say you sold and da, 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 da. Okay. Are you still engaged in any of those tech companies that you founded a while ago? No, nope, I am out of tech. Out of tech completely. So what do you think about, did you ever exist in Silicon Valley? I did all my companies operated in Seattle, mm -hmm. but I have uncountable numbers of airline trips to San Francisco and Silicon Valley over those 20 years. It never uh, inspired you to just stay? Oh, no. It's, uh, the nest. I like living in a small town where I can walk to the market and whatnot. And it's just urban sprawl down in Silicon Valley. Um, so, mm -hmm. so go ahead. Yeah. So I'm going to say uncountable. I, I mean, like. Dozens, dozens. Seattle and San Francisco are close enough that if you get on the 6 a.m. flight, you can sleep in your own bed. You can get home by 11 p.m. Yeah. So I did a lot of those trips. So when I say we raise money from California VCs, mm -hmm. get on the 6 a.m. flight, have three or four meetings in the Bay Area, and then fly back home the same day. Did you ever work with the future VP? No. Do you know who I'm talking about? I, You know, I'm going to sneak in a little bit of politics in there. <laughs> I can't VP help it. Future VP or future POTUS? I don't know what the, I don't know what's going on here. 
Can you tell me? I'm going to be unleashed now. This is Frankly Speak with Sandra D. We got the structured part out of the way. We talked about the BZs. Now, can we talk about the United States a little bit? Just a little bit. Sure. Oh, barely, I want to hear what you think. I have opinions, but I will just be quiet and listen. Give me what but, you think, what's happened in the last two weeks. What's really interesting is my job is to help these companies grow by providing them the capital that no one else is providing them, right? Right. And so I spend a lot of my time talking to prospective investors. Mm -hmm. We have over, over 200 investors in this company. Mm -hmm. I've talked to thousands of potential investors. Mm-hmm. For, from Americans and Europeans and Asians and everyone not from Africa, you know, you get a lot of questions, especially if they've never invested there before that. How do you deal with the risk? How do you deal with all the political issues that happen? Yep. The geopolitical. Africa, mm -hmm. Right. And I just, you know, and again, we started this company in 2020 mm -hmm. after January of 2020, you know, it, it, right at COVID, right. That was an election year. And, and this company's existed after January of 2021, after January. Mm -hmm. So Gen I'll just flip it back to them and say that it's no different than here. It's really, there's some corruption that happens in Africa, but the difference, but here. the difference is it's not legal. <laughs> what? Come on. Elon Musk announced last week that he was going to give a candidate of the presidency $45 million, million dollars a month. A month. Yeah. And that's legal. And well, the Senate, what well, the VP announced, he was get he got fifteen million from Silicon Valley for his Senate seat. Yeah, yeah, and this is legal. And then we can go to like, okay, well, we have checks and balances here, right? Our government is perfect because we have three branches and they check each other. Yeah, and yet one of the Supreme Court justices has received four million dollars worth of gifts. Look and that's that. apparently legal. Yeah. So, so Africa is a lot less corrupt than we see here. Can I just say, so I didn't come to this country. I wasn't born here. But after my studies, everyone in Haiti was saying, well, isn't it time you naturalize? I was like, no, I'm going to, I want to keep my citizenship. While Haiti went down the hill, I was like, fine, I'll become an American citizen. And they're like, well, think about it this way. You can learn about American democracy and how honest and transparent the government here is here. I want a refund. <laughs> no, no, no I, I, it's, it's the best system there are as compared to all the rest. Correct. But they told me it was completely up, 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 just outstanding government. And there is no sniffing around to figure things out. It's just transparent. And I'm, what I'm looking at now, I'm thinking, I think I've seen a few of these moves in Haiti. I think I've seen a few of the switching of the guards and yeah, I, I, I can't I, keep up. I spend more time uh, a block that way or two blocks that way is the uh, city hall for my town. I know uh -huh. most, of the, most of the council people. Uh, a few blocks that way is where the school district headquarters is. I know the superintendent has met with her. Uh, I don't remember where Parks. Parks usually meets here and there. We have a separate right. Parks district. I've been, I've been to there. I spend my time on that level of politics more. Mm -hmm. where so local, at the local level, of course, because you have children, you think about the school boards, you think about how the, your immediate surroundings are being affected by policies. So yeah. I don't blame you because you can that, just... At that level, no, there's no corruption. It's totally up and up. Pe people are not being paid for their time to do the work they're doing. True. Uh, and I True. have volunteered for some of these organizations to provide my own help and expertise when mm -hmm. you know, that was needed and helpful to the community. Um, no, I don't donate $45 million to a presidential candidate once or monthly or ever would. This is such an amazing time to be alive, I have to say. Wouldn't you agree? And uh, I don't think, I mean, I don't think we've ever seen anything, so many moving parts. Let's just call them moving parts. I don't know <laughs> how China managed to get such interesting times on us, but, but they did. My goodness. So speaking of which, so in Africa, you are, you, you have boots on the ground. You're very active. And I want to see the, your sweatshirt because I see you're not fully. <laughs> Yay. I love it. Africa eats. Show the whole you can't see it. But that's perfect. Beautiful. We love that. For those of you that are not, that are just listening to the podcast, we just, I just forced Looney to show his sweatshirt, which says Africa Eats. Are those for sale? Can anybody go and buy those? No, we, there's a, we give them away to our guests at our gathering and that's it. 
Oh, we don't sell right. merch now. You no merch, no merch. All right, so that's I'm sorry that it's going to become the, the, the shipping would be hell trying to ship a, an African. You know, I think this is one of the two that was printed in the U.S., but the the rest we get printed. Oh, they're made overseas. Okay, I understand. So we talk about. So do you ever have any challenges with the government as you're trying to navigate these their regulations and their how can I say complex systems? No. No, it's not bad. Do, you know, again, we're a Mauritius domiciled company. Mauritius is lovely. It's again like Delaware, no corruption at all in that country. No um, threats of expulsion. None of that. No, 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 we no. hear a lot of that's going on in certain countries in Africa. I guess that happens more with like Central Africa. I can't tell for sure, but one is we're in food and ag, mm -hmm. so it's it's the most essential product there is. Mm -hmm. Right? The people can't live without it. We do staple foods, so we're not like exporting tea. Mm -hmm. uh, we're paying farmers really well. We're not exploiting anyone along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only issue that I've ever heard of coming bubbling up from the bottom mm -hmm. is the tax authorities, as these companies get bigger, the tax right. authorities get more aggressive, and you can't argue with them. Mm -hmm. so you fill out, you know, the companies fill out the forms. Send in the forms, send in the money that matches the forms, and then the tax authorities come back and ask for more. Okay. Uh, that's so but tell me, who else is on the ground? I mean, of course, you're an American entity who's going, your group is mostly American, but do you no, see no, 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 no. I'm the token American. There's only mm -hmm. me. Everyone else is African. Everyone else is African. So yeah. as far as do you have any competitors that are maybe out of China, out of Russia, out of the UK? I know I'm getting into geopolitics again, yeah, but yeah, right. so indulge me. Think of two two levels here. Is there any competition to Africa Eats as an investment company? Yes. Well, there's about 300 institutional investors that invest in African SMEs. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see them as competitors. We see them as co-funders. Mm -hmm. And we have never had a deal where we've competed for a specific investment because with someone else saying that they want it more than us. Mm -hmm. saying we want it more than them like timing wise either we made the investment or someone else has and, and that's been it and then each of the companies mm -hmm. uh, right the operating companies again we're minority owners in these companies they're not it's not a conglomerate sure uh, they all have comp competition in some form okay uh, but typically uh for the, our biggest companies they're the ones that are the most formal. They're often the biggest of their kind in their country or the second biggest of their kind. Mm -hmm. And that competition is of the stage that they were two or three or four or five years ago mm -hmm. and hungry for some finance. Um, so we're not seeing a ton of head-to-head -head competition. We don't have price wars or anything like that. And mm -hmm. in terms of capital from other places, in all my years investing in Africa, I have never once seen any Chinese fund or Chinese investor investing in an SME. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese money seems to be put into infrastructure. And infrastructure. Oil. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. I've never seen any Middle Eastern money in SMEs. Russia? I'm sure that it's there, but I've never seen it. I, I don't know where it is. And most of the capital flowing into this, those 300 institutions in us are American and European. Really? Not even India? I have interacted with a ton of Indian, both both Indians from India who are living in Africa or working in Africa, mm -hmm. as well as most Americans probably don't know, but like there's been Indians in East Africa for like Ever. generations. Like, of like, course. It's fun to compare because like my family's been in the U.S. for 120 years mm -hmm. and I'll be sitting down with someone in Nairobi or Dar or whatever. And their family's been in East Africa for 120 years and they're like the third, fourth generation born in, in, in East Africa, but they're you know, from India, from air quotes for the podcast listeners. But in terms of capital flows, no, I haven't seen it. None, zero. Interesting. Well, not think... zero. Avishkar is doing something. That's the group that runs the conference, but I actually haven't seen what they've invested in. I've not interacted with those companies. So a teeny bit, let's just say a, a, a teaspoon. That's interesting. So I tried to really pack this podcast. There's a lot here. Put your comments. What would you like us to flesh out? Because you're coming back. 
That's okay. not a question. Uh, it's a statement. If any, everyone who's listening knows me, when I say something, it is law, it is divine, it is done. So just to give the audience some tips and some ideas on how, if they are interested in taking this path toward venture capitalism and bringing someone like you into a venture, how do they prepare? Give us some final thoughts about that. All right. So if you're trying you so this is an entrepreneur who wants to invest. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So the expectation here in the 2020s is that you interact in the form of a pitch deck. Uh, that pitch deck, if you ask 20 investors, they'll give you 20 opinions of exactly what, what it looks like and what's in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a uh, reasonable consensus that it's 12 to 15 slides long, that it covers the problem you're solving and the solution team. The opportunity size, your traction, your history, what have you accomplished? Where are you going in terms of financial model? How do you make money? How much do you need? And what are you going to spend it on? That's and your competitors. Point. If you're penetrating a market that's already existing, is that important? If you're in a highly competitive market, yes. In, in the spaces I work in, no. There's so much opportunity that it doesn't matter. Um, wow. I don't, Fantastic. I, don't, I, don't dwell, I don't dwell on the competition too much. I yeah. want to know if they exist, but usually the answer is not really. And don't say there's no competition. There's always competition, but is there any serious competition? That'll get summarized into 15 slides. I actually have on my website a slide-by-side -side lesson, right? I'm a teacher. So a slide-by-side -side lesson showing how to put that together, what on each slide, what it looks like, what do you say? And I have two versions of a pitch deck from a Ugandan company to show how to improve it. So my personal website, which Sandra will put in the notes, is lunarmobiscuit.com, which I'm not going to Eat that again? It. Say it again? It's lunarmobiscuit.com. If you just search for Looney Startup or Looney The Next Step or Looney Af Africa Eats, Google will find you this website. Absolutely. It's very long word starts with Lunar. And the, the page called Pitching is the one that walks through that lesson. But there's a whole book on pitching as well. It's on the website. Like those first books I wrote, they're all on the website. And your book that the, you say that's only on Amazon, tell us the name of the book again. The book is called The Next Step. And literally you go to the website, go to this website and on the top navigation, you'll see the next step. You click there, you'll get previews or the whole books and then it links off to Amazon. I'm going to put it as long as we're doing plugs here. If okay, Africa plug, it, plug sounds, away. If Africa Eats sounds interesting, we are actually running a WeFunder at the moment. So you can own shares in Africa Eats. You go to wefunder.com slash Africa Eats. It's $100 minimum. We're actually looking for as many investors as we can, as opposed to as much money. So please don't invest too much. Put in $100, $200, $500, $dollars, but don't give us more than that. We'll have another opportunity for people to invest as soon as we're public. That'll again be near the end of the year before the holidays. After the election? Before the election. Really? Um, it all goes according to plan, right? It, still, it's still things can go wrong, but the plan is the end of October. So there'll be more opportunities to invest in and buy these shares as well as two of the BZ. They're going to be listed as well. So there'll, there'll be an easy way to, to buy shares and there'll be more BZ listing next year. Uh, and then the newest book, you didn't ask about this one because you didn't know. I'm it. waiting for you to tell me all about the new book. Go Published ahead. Published on Tuesday. Um, it's called Berkshire Africa. And I it is, did see that on your, but tell us about that. Yeah. So this is the first book I co-wrote. It's written by me and Jemani. Uh, and it is outlining a teeny bit of history of Berkshire Hathaway, right? The, the big giant investment company, uh, Warren, mm -hmm. Buffett, Warren right? Buffett. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he just, he's doing okay. Like he, he, he bought his shares. He didn't start the company. He bought his shares at seven and change. Yep. Uh, they're $620,000 a piece now. So he's okay. Well, I'm not going to worry about him and his kids. Um, and he's, he's very happy. He's a happy chap. He's one of the people that I don't mind having all that money. So, you know, some people I was like, I don't want you having, I'm, I'm, you scare me, but oh, no. one, he, he, he's a lovely human being. He's a good human being, but yeah. there are some others I must say, question mark, but keep going. So there's a little bit of history on like how he did what he does and how that company works. And the reason we did that is because we're applying his lessons of 60 years of, of the way he did business to Africa. 
And so sure. Africa Eats, the way we talk about it is Africa Eats uses the Berkshire Africa business model. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to explain it and teach it to others so that we have competition. We would love that. Mm -hmm. competition. If competition would mean too much money chasing deals in Africa, right? So the reason why there's a, a little history of Berkshire Hathaway is that we took a lot of the lessons from Warren's work for 60 years at that business, mm -hmm. applied them to investing in Africa. Mm -hmm. And the way we talk about it is that Africa Eats is using the Berkshire Africa business model. That's how mm -hmm. we talk about it in the book. And then the rest of the book is what that model is. How does that actually work in practice? Mm -hmm. every day, down to the every day, like how do we make investment decisions? Um, and it just got published. Congratulations. Congratulations. So did you have to, did you just basically did some research on what's already published and what's in the public space. Did you actually reach out to Mr. Buffett to say, let me ask you a few questions. Of course. Yeah. I read multiple biographies, listened to hours and hours and hours of analysis of Berkshire Hathaway. We talk about that in the bibliography in the back. I went to the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting this year for the first time. Mm -hmm. Same room with Mr. Buffett, listened to him answer questions for five hours, him and Greg Abel. I'm sorry, I missed Charlie last year. And uh, yeah, of course I reached out to him before I went to Omaha and I asked him if he could spare a few minutes of, of time. And I got their normal response from his, his admin saying he doesn't do that anymore. So he must be grieving because Charlie passed away last year, right? It was sad. It, Charlie passed away right before his birthday. So it was December last year. They would have been a hundred in January. They were like twins. They were always together. No, in fact, they weren't always together. Oh, no, God. the history is so fascinating. They grew up like four, four or five blocks from each other, half a mile from each other. They mm -hmm. both worked at Warren's uncle's store, but not at the same time. They didn't meet until they were late twenties, early thirties, and they weren't business partners until the like the nineteen seventies. They seem oh. like a pair of socks, like very comfortable yeah. together. They said, as soon as they met, they hit it off. They thought alike. They acted alike. They were they not were. Like twins, but no, they actually didn't work together formally. Really? For the first like 20 years of their relationship. Well, you just broke my heart. I thought they were like soulmates and they were always together. Oh, kind of playing they're from... definitely soulmates. I'm not denying that. But for whatever weird reasons, there's a, I did some blog posts. I didn't put it in the book. Mm -hmm. There's just this really fascinating. Now, let me summarize it this way. Warren never sat down and came up with a business plan for Berkshire Hathaway. Hmm. It succeeded despite the fact that it had no business plan, which is something as a, as a teacher, I tell entrepreneurs, don't do it that way. It can work, but it's the hard way. And. In fact, the ideas that Warren had in the 60s when he first bought Berkshire Hathaway, uh -huh. those ideas were terrible. Like, they were not uh -huh. good ideas. And it was Charlie that came. Well, not bad ideas, okay? But right. he would not have succeeded with those ideas. Right. It was Charlie that came along in the 70s. And Warren did say this in the gathering this year, mm -hmm. in the shareholder meeting. He said, whereas I might be the father of Berkshire Hathaway, Charlie was the architect. Fantastic. So they so were Charlie very... designed the system, but he didn't sit down and design it either. What he did was he gave advice to Warren on how to do business in a better way. Hmm. And that better way is simple. Buy great companies and hold them forever. That 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 is what it sums up to. Um hmm. that was not Warren's idea. That was Charlie's idea. Warren had to get talked into it. And ultimately that was the piece that that made Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, but no, they didn't even work in the same city. They work in cities. They just talked on the phone every day. Really? Yeah. My and goodness, I thought they visit. had Sunday dinners together. They were just like... No, Charlie, I... Char Charlie lived in California. He lived in Pasadena. He moved there in the 50s. And Warren never moved out of the house he bought in 56. Well, but I heard about that in Omaha, right? Yeah, yeah. They're both from Omaha. And he but... drives the same car. He's, you know, it's... I, apparently, he upgraded the car. Finally? <laughs> But, uh, but under duress probably and there are stories about him and private jets because he did break down and buy a private jet for berkshire hathaway in the i think it was in the 90s he called it the indefensible because he didn't mm -hmm. think like he couldn't defend that purchase but like his time is valuable and he flies around a lot and so it probably was worth it but then he did sell it because berkshire hathaway owns 100 percent of net jets 
which is an entire fleet of business. Businesses, right. Right. So he doesn't need to own a jet. He instead bought an entire business of business. Jets. Sounds like a good plan. Because to it makes money. Like not because it saves him money, because it makes money. Well, I thought it would be because he's into the whole phenomenon of climate change. And no, no. He's not? Absolutely not. But he hangs, he spends a lot of time with people who do believe in that. There were three votes for Berkshire Hathaway to even measure their climate climate change or carbon footprint. All three votes got voted down. So is he signing up for the ESG score card? No, no. Berkshire Hathaway. What do you think about that? Tell me. Be honest with me. I know you're in Washington where it's big. Tell me your personal, because you're a New Yorker. Don't forget, you're a New Yorker, and then you went to Texas, and then you went, to, where else did, have you been? So I, tell I, me your holistic view of this whole trend phenomenon, climate change, ESG, E, what is it? DEI. Go uh, for it. In, five, in, in two minutes? I'm going to do it in two minutes. All right. Two minutes. Uh, I got four kids. They need a planet they can live on. Absolutely. Climate, Check. Climate change is real. Um, but it is for, just be clear, my personal is for the global north to fix because it's the global north that created the problem. Indeed. Uh, I'm going to include China in that at the moment because they're the largest mm -hmm. emitter of CO2. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not Africa's problem to solve. And so if we have to burn some diesel moving food around in diesel trucks, we're going to do that. So be it. Yes. Uh, Poverty is a bigger problem. If we can solve Indeed. poverty, we can solve climate change. And we can't solve poverty without burning some diesel fuel. Correct. Uh, ESG, ESG is a reasonable way to measure whether a company cares about more than just its profits. It doesn't measure at all whether the company's operations and its product and its service is good for the planet or not. So at least eight of the top 10 companies, if not 10 of the top rated ESG companies are fossil fuel companies. Mm-hmm. So, um, but ESG contains more than just the climate issue. I think it contains a lot of... So, so any measure that says Chevron is the number one best company in the world by that measure, <laughs> not the right measure uh, for climate or social justice or, or wealth inequality or anything besides, you know, some criteria that show that they have women on their board and they recycle the paper in the office and a few other things. So it's, it's good, but it's far from perfect. It is. Uh, and then from DEI, as the DEI employee of Africa Eats, as the sole <laughs> token Bazunga. Oh, um, I love that. Yeah. Oh, I'm, my I'm, goodness. I'm, I'm totally for it. When, when, you when are, right? <laughs> you are, like, wearing that badge really proud. Well, you know what? We could learn from that because it applies everywhere. You know, we, we could turn the table on I, to... I, 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 more, more, more seriously. So, yeah, I, I live in a country that is highly socially unjust, um, and can't solve every problem. I'm solving poverty and hunger in Africa, mm -hmm. and I'm using every privilege that I'm given to do that. You're so, a good person. You're um, absolutely a good person. You're a good soul. I'm so glad you came on the podcast. You need to learn from this man. Those of you who are acting badly on humanity, I'm gonna call you out. This message is for you. Learn from Looney. Go to his website. Go to purchase his books, two of them, more recently, the one on Berk Berkshire Hath Hathaway. And also invest. What's the minimum again that you can invest? In $100. You don't need any accreditation. Okay, perfect. And give them your website again, Looney. Uh, simple. We'll go to africaeats.com for the company and lunarmobiscuit.com for my personal website. And how can they reach you directly if necessary? Put a comment uh, at the bottom and I'll get the message to him, but you can give an email if you desire. No, despite Elon's thing, easiest way to catch me is either is, is Twitter. I'm not calling it by its other name. And I'm at Lunar Mo Biscuit there. I'm also at Africa Eats there or LinkedIn. You'll find me on LinkedIn. So I just have a quick question. Do you like Mr. Musk? I could do without Mr. Musk. I could do without. I used to like him. I mean, he's just suspicious right now. And I don't know what to make of that. There are a lot of people in the world that are very suspicious. I have a big question mark. Well, on that note, in order to unravel this question mark, come back to another episode of Freckly Speaking with Sandra D. And today, the episode with, was with co-founder of Africa Eats and 
ex well still venture capitalist but ex software developer tech guru author what did i miss that's good enough teacher and, oh father and husband correct yeah. Yeah. Those are the most important, I would say. Looney, please come back. I definitely want to talk to you about, you have some interesting views. You're a world traveler. Thank you for joining me on an episode of Frankly Speaking with Sandra D. It has been my pleasure. I've not laughed this hard in a long time. Thank you so much for putting a smile on my face. Wow, All right. Thanks. Until yeah. next time, everyone, take care. Oh, and don't forget... Subscribe to Frankly Speaking with Sandra D's podcast and join us every week as we uncover the stories of those who triumphed over life-altering challenges to achieve not just financial success, but a richer, a deeper, a more altruistic life. It's about time we redefine what it means to be a truly affluent individual. Don't you agree? So come and join me. And let's be unstoppable on this journey called life. Because here, affluence isn't just a buzzword. It's a path to waking up to your authentic being.